Why don't you talk about what the super force is and how you believe that solves some of the problems in quantum gravity? Okay. It's interesting because you can say this would go back to Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, I think it was 1693. I could be possibly wrong with you. He writes a letter to his friend in, in which he says, what if, what if gravity is caused by an agent, capital A, that acts constantly in accordance with given laws of nature? Why, what if this agent, capital A, is the super force? And what I mean by the super force would be like the force of unification, the force would that would rule over the other forces and equalize all forces. I believe it does exist at the Planck scale. Now, why at the Planck scale? Look carefully at the structure of general relativity formalism that's used by Einstein. And I shall not use Ricci or uh, Riemannian curvature formalism. I'll use Einstein tensor. So G sub mu nu equals what? Eight, eight pi big G divided by C to the fourth. The whole thing times T sub mu nu. That T sub mu nu again, representative of energy density. But look carefully at that scalar constant. It has a term in it, C to the fourth divided by big G. Well, if you do the math, that term comes from a Planck energy divided by Planck length. So your Planck mass times C squared, the whole thing divided by GH bar, divided by C cubed, the whole thing one half, the thing comes up with C to the fourth divided by G. How can you get a Planck force featuring within general relativity and it goes further you can find the c to the fourth divided by big g what's i term the super force this force of unification in the dirac equation which is the relativistic form of schrodinger equation the foundational form formalism of quantum mechanics which is absolutely remarkable that the c to the fourth divided by g should figure not only that but the super force equals the Planck force. And the Planck force does not have H bar in it. So it's non-Planckian in nature. It's classical, which means the super force, which equals the Planck force at the Planck scale, is the bridge between the world of the very large, namely general relativity, and the world of the very small represented by quantum field theory. And according to Professor J. Armas, this is what's needed, a force of unification, a bridge that would unify all four known forces, in this case including gravity, even though some people think of it as non-force. They think of it as a space-time geometric curvature. But if you look carefully, okay, and now that I've said what I've said with the C, four, uh, C to the fourth divided by big G, look carefully at Einstein equation. It can be reformulated. It actually saying that the super force acting on the space-time geometric structure gives rise to energy density, hence matter. And you can just see by rearranging the terms of the equation that that's exactly what's saying. Not only that, if you look carefully at the Bekenstein-Hawking formulation for entropy of a black hole, C to the fourth divided by big G also features in that because your entropy of a black hole would be given as H bar divided by actually uh, K sub B, which is the Boltzmann constant, divided by H bar C that term times c to the fourth divided by g times your area of the black hole. That would be your entropy. And you can actually see that I am correct. The actual and the significant again is that it is the super force acting on the area of the black hole that generates this black hole entropy. Hence, I believe it's the super force that's the bridge. The c to the fourth divided by big g 
which is non-Planckian in nature, acts as the bridge between the world of the very large and the world of the very small. And it is, it exists at the Planck scale at every point in space and time. Okay, so help me understand yeah. what does it mean when you say that it acts on it? So firstly, let me make this clear. When you say super force, you're referring to the Planck force. And people can look yes. at what the Planck force is. Yes, okay. Yes. And then secondly, when you say it acts on it, so let's imagine we have G equals K times T. And forget about G is Einstein. Forget, I'm just making up some right. variables. I right. could have right. said X right. equals K times Y. Right. I wouldn't say K is acting on Y, but you're saying K is acting on Y in that case. So what does that mean? To me, I see that as a proportionality constant. So as like right. a conversion factor. Okay. So think of the analogy between uh, the main formula of general relativity, g sub mu nu equal that scalar constant times t sub mu nu. Now, transform it into dimensional character. Just think of it uh, would be one divided by L square, where your L would be some characteristic length, could be the Planck length, mm -hmm. equal uh, um, L divided by E, times E divided by L cubed. What's so the energy? energy? Okay. Right, right. E divided by L cubed, that's your energy density term. Well, what is a force? It's, a, it's really the gradient of an, of an energy. That's why that E divided by L is really your super force. And if you just put that term on the other side, it's actually saying it's the super force acting on your space-time geometric curvature that yields your energy density, hence matter. So I believe it is the super force that generates matter based on whatever that space-time geometric curvature local in that particular domain is. So you could actually have a different idea of what, it's just remarkable what Einstein has come up with. It's, it's, if you just restructure it, you see a whole different meaning of his formula. But still, and it says it is the super force acting on the space-time geometric structure that gives rise to energy density, hence matter. That is interesting, I think. It's new, anyway. It's just a new way of looking. It's just a new perspective on old physics. Okay, so let me state it in my words and see if this aligns with what you're saying. Yes, sir. Okay, so traditionally in Einstein's equations, you have G, which which colloquially is space-time, and so geometry. And then on the right side, there's T, which is the stress-energy tensor, which is thought of as the matter. Now, these are coupled, but you can think of it as geometry, and then there's some proportionality constant in the matter. Now, you're saying that it's 8 pi divided by the Planck force. So let's just move the Planck force to this side. So Planck force times the geometry equals yes. 8 pi times the matter yes. distribution. And you can think of the super force or the Planck force in this case. Uh, what is the super force? It is the Planck force because it acts at the Planck scale. So therefore, the super force equals the Planck force. So what that equation now says, it's the super force that's acting on the space-time geometric structure that yields your T sum you knew, your energy density, which represents matter. Okay, I'm gonna to need to think about that some more because I still don't see, so the way that I see it is that, okay, cool. These numbers come up in a couple different places. It comes up in quantum mechanics and it comes up in relativity. And these are what we're trying Again, to merge. Keep in mind, C to the fourth divided by big G. Why should it come up in the Dirac equation by a manipulation of the terms in the Dirac equation or the Schrodinger equation and also in general relativity? And just think of it actually even easier than that. If this force, C to the fourth divided by big G, why should it be non-Planckian in a classical realm? Because it is Planck energy divided by uh, Planck length that all of a sudden loses its h bar term. So it becomes classical. Why? Because the super force must exist and it's 10 to the 44th Newtons. I believe it actually act, it acts at what uh, eventually when I talk about the Ashtakar bounce point. And you can give more in your podcast 
you understand this because you read the right. Yes, so Ashtakar's bounce, what, what Sal is referring to is this paper called The Robustness of Key Features of Quantum of Loop Quantum Cosmology. So people can look that up, that will be in the description. Okay, now you're saying this bounce is relevant to your work because? Because I'm saying it's the super force that acts at the Planck scales that's at this bounce point, this Ashtakar bounce point, that actually, you can think of it as saying thus far and no further. By actually saying there are no space-time singularities, 